Where are you going? I thought I'd finished for the day. You finish when I say. But there is nothing left to do. Oh, there's plenty left to do. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rollane. Each episode of The Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. We are at episode 99, Back to Cole's Choice. What will we be discussing today? Today I wanted to talk about The Duke of Burgundy from 2014, directed by Peter Strickland and starring Sissa Babbitt Knudsen and Chiara Donna, with production design from Peter Sparrow, art design by Renato Casse, and music from Cat's Eyes. It's about the complex psychosexual relationship between two women and the games of dominance and subservience that they play. Now, before we get into the film proper, I wanted to talk about erotic films in general for a little bit. This is the first time that we've devoted an entire episode to a film in which eroticism is a primary focus. What took us so long? I don't know, because we both filthy. (laughs) Well, to be fair, now that we're more than three years in, I feel that way about every first. We still haven't gotten to Herzog, Cassavetes, that list just goes on and on. We just did our first Russian film, for example, in our very last episode. There's still so much to cover, but like you say, this is a subject that's near and dear to our hearts, right? Was there a reason why you specifically chose Duke of Burgundy right now? It kind of didn't even work out the way I planned. I chose this for February for more of a Valentine's Day selection, but then we had our fantastic patron, Ian Buckley, who pledged at the tiers that let him choose an episode, so that got slotted in before this and bumped this into March. Why I chose this one, as opposed to the dozens of others that are also at the top of that list in this particular category for me, I can't particularly say. You know we operate a lot by feel when we are coming up with what we're going to do next, and it just seemed like everything was pointing to this one. I think really there's no bad time to talk about this one, and we've got a lot to cover, and I'm so glad that you mentioned many of the really important crew members who contribute so much to how incredibly beautiful and fascinating this is. Yeah, they certainly all contribute to a specific atmosphere, for sure. We should say, in case you haven't listened to us, we strive to be a very sex-positive show. This film occupies a narrow band, I feel like, on the spectrum of sex in cinema. We would have to start an entire second podcast to cover all the facets of that subject. That being said, what makes for a good erotic film, in your estimation? How do they fail and succeed? Does it just depend on what you're in the mood for that day? That's what I was going to start with. Am I looking to be excited sexually, to be titillated, to find something else beyond that? I guess it just totally depends on the mood, like you mentioned. I will say that there has to be something in it that strikes my fancy. What I mean by that is you can't just slap any two, three, four, five people up on screen and expect me to be interested in it. Well, arousal is obviously important. That's sort of the whole point. If you can't somehow come to terms with that within yourself as a viewer, you might not have the best time. Sometimes that will be an even balance between what stimulates your loins and your brain. Sometimes it isn't, if you know what I mean. All those reactions are perfectly valid. Personally, I tend to look at it like I would any other genre. Dumb turns me off. To clarify that, though, I am not lumping intentionally silly or playful entries in with that. And there are a lot of films that are not great movie making that still succeed on this front just because they're so brazen. Jess Franco, for instance, will never be confused with Andrei Tarkovsky. But he churned out movie after movie in which flesh, in one way or another, is the primary preoccupation, and some of them work incredibly well on just that level. I'm going to say something controversial here. Okay. I have yet to find one that does. (laughs) You've never seen Vampiros Lesbos? No, I, I don't think I have. 
so there are still a lot of opportunities to find that exception for me. Take my word for it. There are at least a handful, I think, that you would enjoy on that level at least somewhat. Valerian Borovchik wasn't as prolific as Franco, but he also turned out a pretty idiosyncratic body of work devoted largely to sexuality and its place in nature, which ties to this film a little bit. Films like that are a big touchstone for the Duke of Burgundy, and in fact, its visual aesthetic is very much built on the bones of that 70s era erotica. Some of which I have seen, definitely, but there are big holes for me. And I was looking at an article that Peter Strickland had written about some of those films that really directly led to the Duke of Burgundy. And sadly, I haven't seen any of them yet. A big one of those, which I've got to remedy really soon, is Belle de Jour. And he actually said, if you watch Belle de Jour, there's no need to watch this movie. <laughs> I would disagree with that assessment. But yes, you certainly should see Belle de Jour. Well, let's talk about this opening scene a little bit. This opening scene and credit sequence is obviously a fantastic homage to that style of filmmaking, as a matter of fact. It's a beautiful woodland scene, enigmatically shot from behind the character. So we get this sun-dappled landscape and the implication of a larger ecosystem in both the scene itself and what the titles and the soundtrack suggest. These fonts, the music, this distinct throwback visual style, inviting shots of the natural world, lingerie and perfume each get an opening credit. It's an announcement that this will be an appeal to the senses. I was intrigued right away because she is both part of the natural world and not. She's in these greens and browns which reflect that landscape, but she's got that very vivid blue at the same time. And I love those opening credits. It's like Belle and Sebastian meets Jalo meets Griffin and Sabine, all without being incredibly chwee. I was also aware, as I was watching those credits unfold, that the main production team seemed to be mostly men. And so I was wondering, how will this go? And I was excited to see, as you mentioned, that those who manage the look and feel are pointed out first. So you said you have relatively little experience with some of the films that this is partially paying homage to, the Jess Francos, the Jean Rollins... Do you feel like you might have missed a fair amount because of that? Does it interfere with your enjoyment of this film? Because, for instance, Strickland even went so far as to cast Monica Swin, a frequent Franco and Rollin participant. So there are little Easter eggs for fans of the genre. Is it one of those cases where if you don't know, then you just obviously don't think about it? You know what my answer is going to be. Yes and no. <laughs> it was in doing more research for it that I did discover those Easter eggs, which washed completely over me. However, I do think I've seen enough at this point to get a sense of what the antecedents are here and to really appreciate that. And then even more so to appreciate that this is going to go someplace even more interesting and surprising. But honestly, even if it operated at only one level where you're looking at some beautiful Hungarian landscape, I can't really argue with that. Well, that's what initially drew me in. But then I found... It's only superficial. It's an affect that elevates the form, basically. One Guardian reviewer called it, and this was a positive review, a pastiche of sleaze, and I think that totally misses the mark. We are going to talk about that review later okay, on. Right. That gauzy sensuality is a touchstone, for sure, but it's not the be-all, end-all. This is so much more than genre tropes. When our two main characters meet, the power dynamic is immediately on full display, or so we would think. Cynthia is the severe mistress of the house, and Evelyn is the reticent housemaid whom Cynthia sternly orders about. She puts her through a sequence of increasingly humiliating tasks and then punishment. How much, since you mentioned what you noticed in the credits, how much does the fact that it's two women affect your perception of this relationship? For example, because it's not a heterosexual pairing of man and woman, does it become less threatening to a degree. Because if you put us in their place, if you or see you arrive timidly at my door and then I begin to cruelly dictate your every move, there's a specific suggestion of menace and danger inherent in that. So in this case, more even footing is assumed, I think. Is that what you felt like or were you thinking about it in those terms? I don't think I was right away. I was a little bit more interested in figuring out who is who 
And I noticed as well that there's a bit of an age disparity. Now, I'm not going to make a big deal out of this because it's not a gigantic gulf by any stretch of the imagination. It's not as though one is 70 and one is 20. It's more of a May-September than a May-December. I think so. And so I was watching for those different cues. I was also most interested in, of course, the butterflies, which play such a huge part in the visual look of this. As we're looking at all of these butterfly studies, there's so much colorful variation, but the thing that went off in my head is there are very strict patterns. And even as we're watching what we see is our pattern being set, visually there are some hazy lines that are being introduced. And so I was just waiting at that point, letting it unfold. I guess that's some of the benefit of my having seen it already and being able to know what's coming and think about it a little differently than just anticipating what story is going to unfold. Because as I'm watching it the second time with two women, it specifically removes an entire set of male-female considerations, physical safety, culturally established precedents of domination and submission. No men in the film means there's no counterpoint, like we tend to typically think. And I love the thing that you mentioned about the age disparity. They're not the usual Euro sleaze, willowy 20-year-old. They are mature. They're not naive. But still, they might be looking to address the lack of a particular experience in their lives, no matter how experienced they might be otherwise. So they enter into this arrangement with someone else that is looking for the same or similar things. Age can function in a lot of ways in that regard. I see it as a liberator when I watch this. You know yourself better Maybe you're more confident in asking for what you want and saying no thanks to the things you don't want. Maybe you're more open to a variety of experiences. I see age as a sexual benefit. It's a much more interesting variable in a story like this than inexperience would be. I see it working a couple of ways. It, in some instances, does not give Cynthia specifically any more confidence. There are things that are telling her that she's aging, not as if she's becoming less desirable, but there are things that are breaking down. And really, more than anything, it suggests to me that everything has a lifespan. If you don't know going in, would you suspect the erotic element of it right away based on the credit sequence and that initial meeting, those first few minutes? I didn't, and I wouldn't, and I deliberately did not read much about this, and we didn't talk about it a lot, so I knew basically what it was about, but I was still sometimes expecting other characters to show up. I ask that because if, like you, you're coming in as someone who might not have a lot of experience with those earlier films I mentioned, it might not seem obvious. But if you do have experience with those, the opening credits might as well be a roadmap drawn with naked people. <laughs> I'll buy that map. It does, though, play somewhat coy and close to the vest for a little bit. It intentionally fosters our initial misapprehension of who is in charge, for instance. But the erotic nature of their relationship and the fact that Evelyn is actually the engine for these actions, that's all revealed rather early in the proceedings. And I think the big reveal for me when I knew, oh, things are starting to change, was Cynthia taking off her wig. We come to find out that Evelyn has very precisely scripted these activities herself, and it's a scenario that they play out in a very strict order on a daily basis. After we finished watching it, you said you preferred this information up front as opposed to it being, say, the final bombshell that makes you reconsider everything that you just saw, right? Absolutely. And we're going to continue talking about this, but the film became so much more for me than an erotic film. The second she takes that wig off, and then I start to wonder, is she nervous? She clearly has almost forgotten to put on her shoes, which is an integral part of this costume. So what is it that I'm seeing? What do I know of these women beyond their roles? And I wanted to think about that then so I could continue for the entire film. Yeah, the structure and intention of it is just different from the standard erotic film. It's more about what's exposed through slight variations on a theme than shocking revelations. I did enjoy, though, that brief feeling of having the rug pulled out from under me a little bit in the beginning when we first learned that. It's a good lesson to keep in mind with this film and with anything, things aren't always what they seem. Should we talk a little bit about this house? The production design and art design are immaculate. How would you describe this? It's the most beautiful aspirational scene in the entire universe. If 
what you want your life to be is sex and books and comfortable upholstery. <laughs> I'm about to blow your mind, though. Okay. Do you know roughly what the budget was for this film? What is that? It was about one million pounds, which seems like absolutely nothing. That seems... For the visual feast yeah. that you're given. And there are so many instances of, as I mentioned, upholstery or just amazing interiors, like those tiles. Those were stickers. The wallpaper, often printed pages from websites. How did they possibly achieve all of this within that tiny, tiny budget? So I was going to say, if there's one word to describe it, that's lavish, but maybe that word should be resourceful instead, because it looks like it costs 10 times what it costs to make it. Easily, because, spoiler alert, we watched What Lies Beneath the other day. <laughs> or, strictly speaking, I had it on in the background and you were doing something else. I looked up what the budget for that film was 18 years ago, which was $100 million. Okay, you broke my brain when you told me that. Terrifying. So let's take that money and build 100 sets just like that one. Well, this is what happens, I guess, when you're smart and you're lucky with the choice of location and you know how to spend your money wisely. I think something else important to note here is that Peter Strickland and the crew, they've worked together, a number of them in other iterations, so they clearly know each other. He's working with great people, both British and Hungarian craftspeople. And after his first film, Catalan Varga, he actually stayed in Budapest and had a job teaching English. Another piece of luck, maybe, cultivating those relationships, because those pinned insect cabinets were loaned from the entomology collection of the Hungarian National History Museum's Department of Zoology. So you get to cultivate this academic, old-world feel in this bubble of an environment that these women live in for free. And he's often mentioned, Peter Strickland, that his life has been doing this work to make other things possible and making this art and then going back to doing these other things, which is, seems to be the definition of resourceful. I also think it's really interesting that, especially with that first film, Catalan Varga, he was making a movie in a language that he doesn't speak, read, or understand, which maybe then lends itself well to building this world a world he couldn't possibly know firsthand. Well, the house itself had been sitting unoccupied for a while, and they had the usual problems that come with a house sitting unattended. As a result, they only used about a fourth of the estate, but what they did use is perfect. This world feels almost hermetically sealed. It exists in its own place, in its own time. Did it feel claustrophobic in that regard for you? No, it didn't. Sadly, as frugal as they were, box office for this only ended up being around 175000 which, again, I just don't understand. It's astounding. Do you think it is because it's two women? No, I don't necessarily think it's that. I think it has much more to do with the artiness of it, the crowd that it's pitched at. Because when you look at Carol, for instance, that did well. When you look at Brokeback Mountain, that was a breakout hit. So it's not the homosexuality that I think is keeping people away from it or the gender, I think it has much more to do with what is unfortunately still a misconception that art house movies are weird, and I don't want to go see that if I'm just part of the general movie-going public. I have some definite feelings about it, too, and we don't have to get into that right now. I think that one of the reasons it possibly didn't do as well as I would imagine it should, I think 2014 was a bit of an odd time. I think if it came out right now, it might be a different story. What cultural conditions do you perceive as being so different? Are we talking pre-Trump election? Is, there, is that what you're thinking about, or is it something else? I do think there seems to be a shift in general with power that women are given and how that's perceived. I also think that at least part of it is it's not necessarily designed for male desire, and so that can be tough for some people. We're going to talk about those reviews later on, and I think some of that is reflected in those reviews. Well, maybe some of it can be attributed to the type of sexuality that's on display here as well. And since sexuality is at the center of this, these games they play, how would you describe those? Do you mean they're rigid patterns of do this behavior and I will punish you in this specific way? It could be anything, because we see, for example, there are a handful of kinks on display. Domination and submission, bondage, claustrophilia, water sports. 
What do you make of the way that Strickland chooses to portray those, the aspects of that that he focuses on? Okay, full disclosure here. The water sports that you mentioned. When they go into the bathroom and the door is shut and we hear just the noise, I thought that Cynthia was washing Evelyn's mouth out with soap. <laughs> you are so pure. <laughs> I guess so. And then it was reading about it where I realized, oh, shit. Okay, no, that's not it. I guess I'm going to talk again about how much I was invested in how the relationship itself works. Because I was, again, struck by the fact that she is wearing a costume. And the wigs, what do the wigs mean? If you're just asking me personally, I wouldn't wear a wig unless I felt I had to. So that's what I was imbuing the entire film with. The sense of intimacy that they have, these reflections, the haziness, the sensuality, how beautiful everything is, that then is totally undermined when Cynthia is snoring, for example, or when Evelyn gives Cynthia a line reading. They're all incredibly beautiful, these games. They're exciting. I'm interested in that. I like that area of kink. But as you asked me earlier if I felt claustrophobic in this world, I only started to when I thought about how rigid everything was structured. Well, when I look at the way he presents it, for example, when Evelyn is washing Cynthia's underclothes, it's not exactly a punishment. It's tantalizing, at least in the way it's photographed. Absolutely. Dripping underwear never looks so exciting. <laughs> There's almost no nudity. The first punishment that's doled out, it's more suggestion than explicit, obviously, since you had no idea what was uh, happening. Duh. It all happens behind a closed door, audible but not visible. In fact, the majority of the more explicit acts or kinky acts are handled off screen. As strange as it is to say about a film that includes the prospect of a human toilet as a birthday gift, there's a fair amount of restraint here. I'm thinking about something that Peter Strickland said that I think kind of applies here. Well, into their world in general. He says that he's not interested in social realism. So his first draft was much more about the work that they do and coming into this relationship. And that's completely, well, not completely, but mostly wiped out in this. It doesn't matter what they do. What matters is how they interact with each other. What is the relationship based on? What is tenable and what is untenable? Because he's completely constructed the world. There aren't rules that we know them as. There are no men, period. There are no men that exist in this world. So there's no counterpoint to their sexuality. While we're talking about restraint, something that we occasionally talk about when it comes to films like these, is there a true necessity for explicit sex scenes, especially, say, when it comes to unsimulated scenes? Because I think maybe the lack of those affects how you view this particular film. I think we view it slightly differently. The things that you've said to me in our discussions in between watching and recording about how much of a sex film it actually is. And it's not as though we've argued about it. It's not as though I've said, I can't understand why you see it that way and vice versa. So then where do you come down on that? How necessary is explicit sex and its presentation on the screen? In this film or in general? Just in general. I don't think I have a good answer for that. I'm going to go back to that ridiculous, I'm not sure, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> <laughs> if I feel like, that seeing these people do whatever it is that they're going to do has made me understand something or feel something, then it seems like it's inextricably linked. Certainly for this film, I would say it would be a different animal without it. And I'm going to say a less interesting animal. But as you mentioned, we have different ways of coming into this. I don't think it's success or failure depends upon me feeling something about the eroticism. I agree with you. I think as a general starting point, at least, it comes down to whether or not it's central to the story. And I think this film makes an interesting case either way for the inclusions of sex scenes as part of the story, because it doesn't ever get that explicit. It could, and I don't think it would damage the film in any way. But what it comes down to with this, we are talking specifically about the way relationship dynamics evolve through sex. So how better to understand certain aspects of that than to see them at work. That old saw of, you can tell me who a character is or you can show me, basically. We all know which one of those is more effective. 
And if you're talking about erotic film in general, not just this film, one important element of the success of that would obviously be arousal. We said that before. How stimulating it is. That's one thing, or maybe the only thing, that it's setting out to do. And if that's the case, that's completely fine. I can't sum it up any better, I guess, than I don't think there's anything wrong with sex on screen, simulated or unsimulated. I'm right there with you, unless it involves stonewashed jeans. (laughs) Well, I hear people that are upset about unsimulated sex in film, and they occasionally make the argument, well, characters get killed in these stories too. Do you want to see an actual murder? And I think that's an egregiously false equivalence, let me say. Absolutely. I don't want to commit murder, but I'd love to commit sex. Yeah. One is the ultimate crime, depriving someone of their life against their will. And one is a joyful, satisfying activity taking place either alone or between two or more consenting adults. If you equate sex with murder, may I suggest that you're saying a little bit more about yourself than, say, what John Cameron Mitchell did or didn't achieve artistically with a short bus? And again, in this film, this is what the world is built on. And for Evelyn, this is her central need, how she expresses her desire. I don't know how you feel about this, but I would guess that we'd all probably be generally happier if we could switch out every instance of violence for sex. What would you rather explain to your kids, sex or murder? That's not to say violence should not be portrayed on screen. It's just like any other element. If you use it well, great. If it doesn't work or if it's a distraction... You botched it, but adults should be able to decide if they want to avail themselves of that or not. I guess this means we really need to change that new Netflix algorithm, take murder out, (laughs) leave baking in, add sex, and I guess doggies. That might make for weird internet search results. I don't know that I want to (laughs) go that way. How long do you think it is before we get our first A-lister in an unsimulated sex scene? How far away from that are we? Gosh, I have no idea, because at this point, for example, Nine Songs or Short Bus, those seem like those are a few years old. Yeah, quite a few. And actually, Chloe Savini is the highest level name I can think of that actually has a scene like that in Brown Bunny. That's a pretty big name. And that was even further back. I really have no idea. All I can think about are those Fifty Shades movies, and I don't think they ended up doing as well as people thought they might. No, I don't think it's going to be a movie geared specifically for that. I think it will be more something like Antichrist, but next time maybe just without body doubles. Got it. I'm saying 2025. That's the first time we will see a legitimate A-lister on screen performing explicit sex unsimulated. Okay, are we doing this in the Magic Lantern group as a poll? (laughs) We're going to do it as a pool so everyone can put their bets down. And hopefully I'll cash in on that. Okay, you take 2025. Who are your people going to be? Are we going to add that in? Or should we just leave it at the year? I will say that I don't have names particularly in mind. And things are going to change so much over the course of the next six years. I will say it will probably be someone I don't want to see. I was thinking, gosh, don't let it be Zac Efron or somebody (laughs) like that. Not interested. If only we could turn back the clock and make it Dom DeLuise. (laughs) Okay, anyway, back to the Duke of Burgundy. Great, thank you. When it comes to these two characters, how do you imagine their games developed? Do you think of it more as a case of being bored and intrigued and wanting to expand sexual horizons? Or more a case of, this is what brought us together in the first place. This is our ground zero. The more we learn about this world, it seems to be that this is the accepted way to go, for this community at least. So I think I start to imagine it as... Evelyn was this person who knew that she had these desires inside and didn't really have a place to express them and then discovered this community. It's as if it was sort of waiting for her. Cynthia I see differently, her desire being born out of her love for Evelyn. And so I think Evelyn carried a diary around with her with all of these things written down, these fantasies, and she was finally able to live them. I think you're right on all counts. There are so many things in the film that point us to that, in fact. There are so many things that are built in. We see, for example, in the lecture hall setting, which is a touch that I love, so many of those older films have this type of scene, that it is a world of exclusively women. So that dictates a lot in terms of choice versus alternatives. It changes this relationship from what we would think of as minority representation to just business as usual. 
And the women in this audience, they all seem to be slight reflections of either Cynthia or Evelyn, down to their shiny leather boots. We meet a character later, the carpenter, that is selling sexually oriented furniture, who just sold a similar model to the neighbors, so it feels like this is also par for the course, and to prefer something else would be the quote-unquote deviation. Basically, I like to imagine this as a world that just treats all desires equally. Everything is more common than you think. It reinforces that hope in me that no one ever again is made to feel bad about what they want to do with other consenting adults. In terms of their daily ritual, though, I think you're right on the money. This is something that Evelyn has obviously been thinking about and working on for a while. The precision of it and what that indicates, there seems to be little room for spontaneity, this need for absolute control. It's all centered on her needs. I've got a question here, and it was something I was preoccupied with watching this, and I think it does say more about me or people like me. So I'm wondering what you think about it. Because I was so interested in the relationship itself, and also feeling that idea of the lifespan, I kept wondering, in this specific scenario, with Evelyn, Will the need for escalation exist? Does it just have to become more and more rigid or deeper or darker or something else, whatever that else is, and her partner can't possibly keep up with that? Is that just something that people outside the community think? Or if this is how you feel, will it always satisfy you? I don't know that you could answer any of that. Well, just speaking strictly from my experience, I'm going to steal the patented Erica Long yes and no. There will always be some cases of each one. And it just boils down to personality type. If you are the adrenaline junkie that is always wanting to jump out of planes and climb mountains and always looking for that next thing that's going to raise the bar higher and higher, then yes, some people will never be satisfied and there will always be some element of escalation necessary to feel good. But I think the great majority of people, there's escalation up to a point until they finally hit the thing. They'll hit a ceiling where they feel like, mm, that's too far for me. I will settle into this groove right here, whatever that happens to be. And hopefully they have a partner that's also on board with that. That doesn't burden their partner with that desire. So yeah, I would say almost everyone, yes, if you're looking for this type of thrill, you'll go up to a certain point, find your comfort level. And then that will keep you happy for a good long time with the occasional other experimentation just to see, is this still what I'm feeling like? I'm glad that you said that because that gives me a different perspective I hadn't thought about. You know, I tend to worry things to death sometimes. So I kept going down that road and couldn't really find an end point that felt satisfying. It also strikes me, again, thinking about worrying, that me even asking the question would equate this behavior with murder, as if Evelyn was a serial killer who had to just keep getting worse and worse to be satisfied. Well, it's not the way it came across to me. It seemed to me like you were asking more just about general appetites. You could have just as easily been asking about how many Cheetos can I eat in one sitting? And is that going to satisfy me? Do I open a second bag while I'm sitting here watching this? No, it didn't feel like you were judging it or condemning it in any way. It felt like you were asking very much more just about feeling generally satisfied with whatever pursuit it might be. I don't want to give the wrong impression about what we see here. There is tenderness between these people. Very much so. And I like that Strickland intentionally includes instances of the Euro glamour of the film's predecessors being stripped off to get to those moments. You mentioned one of them, the wig coming off. Wigs are removed. Stockings are torn in frustration. Corsets are traded for pajamas. There's clearly more than just style and sex to this. After hours, outside of the role-playing, do things feel better or just different? To me, it felt like we're starting to see holes, literal and figurative, appear here. Cynthia ripping her hose to get out of this costume in frustration feels so deeply sad. Evelyn chastising her ahead of time, directing her, and then Cynthia keeping her regular PJ bottoms on. And that moment when she is sleeping and she's in pain because of this move that they had tried to do with a trunk that Evelyn had requested so she could sleep that way, she's in pain. And she looks like a regular person instead of a creation that is someone else's vision. Well, it makes me curious about the boundaries of their arrangement. There's a big difference between dabbling and living the lifestyle 24-7. 
a life of constant true service and subservience. And it's a question they directly address. How much of this is a luxury? How much is necessary? It's really a good question the film raises. How much of day-to-day -day life can reasonably be spent pursuing sexual fulfillment, especially if there's an imbalance? And in this world, at least, there's a lot of time devoted to it. Again, we don't see their work. We're not concerned with how they make their money. But then we see, as you mentioned, the after hour stuff. And I don't know how to get inside the mind of a person who wants to live that specific life 24-7. I don't know how that mentally works. I think of all of the things that I do that make me feel like a person. And if I couldn't do those things, then who am I? And I think, why I'm so drawn to this, it seems like Cynthia and Evelyn are questioning that for themselves. We find out a little more with each reenactment of their regular scenario. Just the second time, for example, ringing the bell, we learn who is dictating the pace and more about what the stakes are. The power dynamic is not what we initially thought. Who is the true dominant and submissive in this relationship? What is each woman getting out of this? In the repetition of the role play, we also begin to see an increasing dissatisfaction with these assigned roles. We see the prep of all the water drinking this time. There's the boredom in between, clock watching as if it's almost a cubicle job. It's no fun if you're not selling it. It's sex as assignment, and what if you're just not into it that day? And so it becomes about much more than just titillation. We're dealing with the problems that arise when one partner or both is not getting what they want, what they need, when there's an imbalance in the relationship. You're not happy, but you still want to make your partner happy. You want to make them feel good. How do you then muster that conviction that they need in your eyes, in your voice? Things are seldom going to be equal, right? I assume not, especially if the one desire is so specific that there isn't an opportunity for deviation from it. And so I enjoy in this film seeing those frustrations come out, those frightened dreams, Cynthia holding back tears at one point, Evelyn changing to address her needs, how something relatively simple like a massage then turns into a chore. Yeah, the thing that makes this depiction interesting is just that. We can see how the power shifts, even if the script literally remains exactly the same, things still break down within that framework. And when I think about scripting things, it's no small task that Strickland gave himself here. Write and direct an incredibly intimate love story between two women in a world apparently populated only by women. He's talked about the inherent issues, especially when your starting point is paying homage to sexual exploitation films. Is there a gaze issue here? How successful do you think he was at this? I talked about this at the very beginning, seeing those credits happening and wondering... Is a man going to get this, even though that is not my world either? And I really appreciate that Peter Strickland seems to be a person with an incredible amount of emotional intelligence. And I think he demonstrates it, and I think it permeates this film and these characters. And he talks about the gay's dilemma. That he's always going to be a male, and that though he was paying some homage to these sexploitation films in which that lesbian lovemaking is a trope, and a lot of them are kind of disreputable, and that they were made, generally speaking, for heterosexual males to get off. So instead of trying to disregard the impulse, he simply tried to go about it by being less male rather than more female. He felt it would be insincere to try to adopt a female gaze and also had no interest in generally just being crude. So he focused on mood and the actual work. So he successfully avoided the pitfalls of the arrogance of assuming this gaze, and he avoided just being crude, like you say. Hence, it's not just another sex movie, right? It's not how you think of it. It's not how I think of it, definitely. I don't know how other people think of it, and I don't think it's bad if it had just been a sex movie. I do think there's a lot more into it. I'm fascinated by their relationship, as I've mentioned a few times. Yes, it's clearly a relationship movie. It's a love story at heart. I do wonder one thing, though. Saying it's not a sex film, does that betray a bias? Does that diminish the type of sexual relationship that it portrays? It does revolve around sex, very much so. It's inextricable from the story. Just not vanilla sex. 
just not what is thought of as a traditional sexual experience. So if we downplay that, are we doing a disservice to those pursuits? I've been really struggling with this. I really have since we watched it because I think of it in such a different way. It doesn't arouse me. I can say that specifically. However, I'm not turned off or repulsed. I'm just thinking of other things. It could have been my mood or my age even, the time that we're watching it. But I completely agree with you at the same time. I don't want to suggest somehow that there isn't sex or that's not a dominating force. It is. I guess I'm just so dang preoccupied by what I'm experiencing in this relationship. So these things that you're feeling, regardless of whatever the sexual relationship is, it may be sexually unconventional, but underneath that, there are a lot of relatable universal concerns, right? I personally am very interested in thinking about discovering, uncovering, questioning, challenging how a relationship lasts. You have their insecurities and how they manifest themselves in each woman. The sort of usual trappings maybe of that May-September romance in this case. It's such a fragile state they're in. I know exactly what you mean. I'm paying attention to this precarious balance a lot of the time. Any new external influence feels like a potential threat. I feel that with the arrival of a new face at the house. When the carpenter is taking measurements for this specific piece of BDSM furniture. This is important. It's a birthday present. They're willing to pay any price for it. And how crestfallen Evelyn is when it's not going to work out tells me how much she needs this. And I thought a bit of petulance. It's, I can't get it exactly when I want it, therefore I don't want it. And so they're asked this question that contractors don't typically ask. Would a human toilet be a suitable compromise? And Evelyn's eyes brighten at the prospect of this. Is this a light at the end of the tunnel? I fully realize these service details may be too provocative for a vanilla audience to connect with. If so, though, that's such a shame because the core concerns of this story are things that a lot of us feel a lot of the time. Soon after this, we have that scene of Evelyn wandering the house in the middle of the night, eventually coming upon the chest that she'll soon be bound in. She's like a ghost in her own house. She, like Cynthia, is profoundly dissatisfied. No one's in the wrong. They're just not currently connecting the way they desperately want to. That's something I feel like most people can understand. If anything, when you peel back the layer of distinctive sexual motivations, I hope this movie serves to illustrate that no matter what excites you, we're not that different. It is those questions of unintended betrayal, or as I talked about earlier, is she going to need to keep getting something new that is not me that I can't fulfill? Well, as the film progresses, these rituals do continue with more frustration and diminishing returns in this particular case. One partner's needs get more extreme, and the other partner pushes back. Cynthia pushes Evelyn's boundaries out of spite or neglect. Cynthia fails to administer the proper humiliation for the first time. There's the ignoring of a safe word, a big no-no. When they get into these more exotic and explicit bondage situations, what sort of responsibility do you feel like the filmmakers bear for how they represent this? I don't think they're trying to speak for the entire community. I don't think they would be so arrogant again to try to do that. I think they do have the responsibility if they're going to set out on this endeavor to show things the right way. Show people as they are, which I think that they do. And show something that a person who does live in that life wouldn't be offended or upset by. But more than anything, if they brought us characters that we couldn't understand or we found so basic or laughable, that would be the real shame. So even as things deteriorate, as they're making these mistakes and succumbing to petty jealousies and retribution, the systematic repetition continues. We still have these variations on a theme instead of a standard narrative arc. And these variations can be small, but they're always significant. It underlines the power of even tiny deviations from the script. There's the major transgression of polishing another's boots. And I like how this film makes the viewer confront how they may traditionally look at things like their own definition of infidelity and how amorphous those bounds can actually be. Trust is broken, but in a way that might not be the first thing that mainstream audiences think of. 
We also get fewer and fewer of these tender downtime moments as the film progresses. As we get further into the breakdown of established rules and roles, a thing you said at the very beginning made me wonder about this. Was this breakdown liberating for you as a viewer, allowing you to be increasingly less bound to their routine, or did it just result in more tension without release? Absolutely. I was so tense, and I'm still tense, because when we get to the resolution, it's not exactly a resolution that I think is going to last. So I'm still thinking about it. Well, prior to that resolution, we do come to a breaking point, and it's the birthday cake scene, which is probably my favorite scene in the entire film. When Evelyn is truly not in control, she's lost. She's truly subservient for the first time. This is not her script. There is no small measure of revenge in this. Cynthia puts her foot on Evelyn's throat while she eats the cake she forced her to make. Finally, she just completely has to surrender, and there's an immense difference between play punishment and real punishment. Still, Evelyn submits to that. What do you make of that? How do you feel about each of them coming out on the other side of this scene? I think it is really interesting. And we talked earlier about their ages. And again, Evelyn is not a kid, but it does feel like a growing up moment, something she really has to confront. And I think essentially it had to happen in that way in order for them to move forward. Fancy that. We completely agree. It's my favorite scene, I think, because everything turns on this scene like a hinge. They each move, finally, completely into the roles that they have only been playing at up till now, and what they find in those places changes everything that comes after. If they don't reach this breaking point, then I feel like maybe they would have just been locked into that cycle of tedious repetition, maybe forever, in the fairy tale bubble of this house. I think it would probably go the way of Evelyn moving in with someone else. Truly, I think. If they had just kept on with that, she would have passively, aggressively gone her own way. Well, that was my favorite scene. Was it yours? Did you have another one that you prefer? I do like that scene. It's more about those moments. And I've hinted at them earlier when we see Cynthia taking the wig off. When she rips the hose, I found that to be very profound. Seeing her sleeping the way that she wants to was also a big deal. Well, we soon come to what I consider the other pivotal scene, and this begins with the camera pushing in between Cynthia's legs. Strickland said he didn't want to be crude, so how much care do you have to take with this? It's definitely something I mused on, and we do have to really remember it comes back to the feminine. That is the cradle of all life, and... The cradle of pleasure and desire for these women. It's incredibly powerful. And still, I don't think it's presented in a crude way. It's a place of control. And this is also in a really anguished part of the film. Yeah, if sexual pursuits are so central to your life and that part of the body wields so much power, you can't ignore that as a filmmaker. Like you said, the creation of life, sex in the womb, the natural world as a larger metaphor. I want to talk about that for just a second. Okay. I go back again to the very beginning when it seems like Evelyn is both part of the natural world and not. We don't actually see Cynthia's vagina because it's completely covered in these unnatural fabrics. Again, I don't disagree with you, but I do find that a fascinating duality to think about. Yeah, there's an awful lot in this simple push-in of a camera. Our most basic primal needs on top of all of that. This is literally and metaphorically where all of that springs from. So fittingly, you are right. This is our entry point into the most emotionally difficult section of the film. A dream sequence is emanating from Cynthia's thighs, essentially. And in this, Evelyn is eventually completely subsumed by this cyclone of moths and butterflies. We haven't talked much about it, and it's obviously a pretty readily understandable metaphor but butterflies are symbolically deployed throughout the film. They're inert. They're captured. They're studied. They are pinned down. And in this sequence, maximum moth equals maximum transformation, I feel like. Here is a moment of absolute rebirth. And I find this hopeful. This colors the entire rest of the film for me. The sound design also in this section of the film, well, in the whole film, I, sh I should say, to be honest. But specifically at this point, it's almost overwhelming how enveloping the sound is. I know sound is an important element to Strickland. When you look at something like the previous film, 
Barbarian Sound Studio that's all about sound and how it creates a universe. Were the sound design and score both of those things particularly appealing to you? Absolutely. And I don't think it will surprise you or anyone who, especially has watched Barbarian, that he found out a couple of years ago that he is one of those people who respond to ASMR stimulation. I think if you then listen back to those films, it will make perfect sense. I'm also just really interested in his relationship to music. He's written quite a bit about this, so I would say to everyone listening, go check out these interesting articles that he's written. He also did a film with Bjork. He made a concert film for her. He also did a radio adaptation of The Stone Tape, a Lantern favorite. I did not know that. I'm going to have to go find that. It sounds incredible. I want to watch the Bjork film as well. He talked about something specifically in that project, which I think lends itself well here, that throwing off a more didactic approach to the natural world to then present things in a different way. Innermost and outermost wonders is what he says, and those can be both benevolent and malevolent. And I think we hear that represented here. As to the music, I personally was not familiar with Cat's Eyes. How about you? Only by reputation. I still haven't heard the previous album. I only know this music by them. And I love it. I think it's perfect. You know, Peter Strickland is so attentive to sound. I think he loves sound as much, or maybe even more than the visual element of filmmaking. And Cat's Eyes is a perfect choice for this. They do exactly what Strickland did. They took those same cinematic antecedents and managed to pay homage to those, but also used them as a springboard into something that feels completely new, but still recognizable. It's not just pastiche. If you told me sight unseen that this music was made in 1973, I could see that. But I would think, wow, this sounds incredibly modern for 1973. And it completely stands on its own when you put it side by side with something like Gerhard Heinz or Philippe Duram, other prominent composers in the Euro sleaze genre from way back when. I think Cat's Eyes were a fantastic choice. I know that Strickland had played them a lot of Mozart to give them a sense of what he was looking for. And then he was completely surprised that they brought back something to him that made him entirely forget Mozart. Well, we're drawing close to the end here. They remove the chest from the bedroom together. These moments of tenderness and passion seem to return. And in the final moments, we find ourselves at the exact same scene that opened the film with the two of them preparing to act out their usual scenario. To me... This return is the ultimate proof that this movie does not judge its characters. Is this ambiguous to you? Who do you feel like is being validated here? Well, just before that, and why we get to that point, Cynthia breaks down and she asks for forgiveness and I think also grace from Evelyn, who gives it to her. And Evelyn does talk about, okay, this is a luxury. I can do without this. I can change. They burn those instructions together. But Evelyn saying those things doesn't make me believe those things. And so I think it is incredibly fitting that we end with the ringing of the bell. We don't know how it's going to play out. I disagree. Okay. I have an argument for this. But I can see where you would say that. It really depends the way you view this ending. If you think of it as the beginning, if it's an endless loop, essentially. Or if this is a new branch. A beginning of a new cycle. Right. I see Cynthia as trepidatious, but hopeful enough to give it another chance now that they've reached a new mutually beneficial understanding. And I have faith in it just based on strict filmmaking technique, what has been shown to us. The dream sequence is key. Without it, I wouldn't feel this way. Strickland has told us, in no uncertain terms, this is a new Evelyn, broken and reborn. Without that sequence, I might be more pessimistic but I really do think that they are on a new, more equitable path. Okay. (laughs) That's cool. You don't feel that way, though. I'm not sure. I don't mean that I'm so pessimistic that I think it's all going to go downhill, but I do think that there's room for either of these two people to go a different way. But either of them going a different way for you entails a lot more heartbreak and difficulty before that point. Well, yes or no, more a just a separation. Really, this comes back solely to how I feel. If you or anyone needed me to look a certain way other than the way that I look in order to fulfill your desires, I don't 
think I could do that for the rest of my life. I totally see that. And that would be completely unfair to expect. I just think that what Strickland is telling us is that Evelyn won't be asking that of her the same way. For the people who have seen it, I'd love to hear what their opinions are about the ending. So it's not Emmanuel. It's not behind the green door. It's not nine and a half weeks. I know you told me after we watched it that the film was not what you expected. Once all is said and done, how do you think this fits into the grand scheme of erotic film? I'm going to answer that question by basically explaining why I think I like it so much. We're not focused on how Evelyn got to be the way that she is, any other sort of alternative community, any judgment of them. We're just thinking about, or I want to say, I'm just thinking about how this couple functions, how they find compromise, and what that means. So then, back to your question, strictly speaking, I think it is a wonderful example, and I hope everybody in the entire universe watches it, whether they're looking to be aroused or not. Maybe they'll find something to identify with themselves. Maybe there's a person out there who really needs to see this to find that non-judgmental approach. It's also beautiful and resourceful. And I did say that I wasn't aroused, but I want to say again, I was not turned off at any point. So if you're looking for a very sexual film, that seems to be much more about an increasingly sad distance and inability to <laughs> express conflicting feelings, go to this one. Well, I chose it for this episode, not necessarily at this specific point in time, but just as a film to talk about, because it surprised me. It subverted my expectations and still didn't lose me. I expected something initially much more in line with those Franco films and got something completely different. And it did that without sacrificing any of its eroticism or allure. Anything that expands the conversation in terms of what is quote-unquote normal sexuality, I'm all in for. And it's excellent filmmaking. It's a masterclass in getting the most out of a budget. All of its components come together in a way that creates a mood that completely envelops you. Before we come to the end, I do want to circle back to something. Some of these reviews that I just don't get talking about why it may not work for some people. Is that okay to do here? Your show, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> okay, hear thanks. It. I read a couple of things that I just don't get. You alluded to one of them. I feel like there was a sense from some people, and this again may be the time that it came out, a suggestion that this is, and this was actually written out in quotes, alternative lifestyle choices, dressed up, that this was somehow not smutty enough to really please the audience, that it was too arty, or even that some things they do are laughable. And this one reviewer had to be specific, no, Peter Strickland is not joking. I do feel like this is about, as I said, I think at one point, a film that's not designed for male desire specifically. I totally see that. And that Guardian review that I specifically referenced, it was very positive. They really liked the film, even though they may have been misguided in that. Four out of five stars. But I guess sometimes people just cannot put their preconceived notions aside. Is that a little bit of it, too? I read something that was basically, I should have been the perfect audience for this, which suggests to me, yeah, you're going into it with a raincoat on. And I didn't like it more. And here's why. Because I think it isn't as interesting as just Franco stuff. And anybody that says that, I, I do, I, <laughs> I have already said, I don't really get it. So I don't get that. I don't get that reference. I don't get why, if it wasn't as crappy as just Franco, I'm sorry. No, there's nothing wrong with that. Jess Franco knew what he was doing. He was turning these movies out in record time over a long weekend. In some cases. Yeah, you're, you're right. You're right. I, I don't need to apologize for that, I guess. I'm not trying to be reductive of even that. But if you say that something seems like the dregs of the penthouse forum, I think you're a jerk. Well, remind me to show you sometime the script I have in Mothballs about when I was a freshman at a small Midwestern university. <laughs> when you were a Shropshire lad. And the odd things that happened. Speaking of odd, there was another of those that characterized this as odd. Is this so outré for some people? Maybe. We were just talking about this about the Beaver Trilogy last night, about how some people found that to be so bizarre. I guess this may be one of those questions of escalation, as it applies to movies. Maybe what we've watched has raised the bar so high that it takes a lot more to shock, disturb us, to move us off, 
of our comfortable position. And I don't mean to suggest that I'm so worldly and turn my nose up at other people. I just don't like the way this is characterized. Well, how about you characterize something positively for us and give us a recommendation? Okay. I chose The Lover from 1992, directed by Jean-Jacques Arnaud, adapted from the book by Marguerite Dura with Jane March and Tony Leung. And it's about the illicit affair between a teenage French girl and a wealthy Chinese man in 1929 French Indochina. We briefly mentioned this in our episode 69, The Birds and the Bees. I picked it because the sex is inextricably linked with the story, and for me at least, it's truly erotic. Yet I think, and I may be in the minority, that the story can actually stand on its own as well. There is a vast gulf between the two characters that's based on age and also wealth, and it's been singled out for its music and sound editing, so it seemed like a good one to include here. I also started reading a bit more of the critical reviews for it, and it seemed like it was generally praised for the soft core stuff in it, but criticized for either taking itself too seriously or not seriously enough, not providing enough background for the characters. I think, also with this film, mostly people just wanted to get off, or not get off, and couldn't have the film satisfy both needs. I think this is a great choice, because this is definitely one of those films where I like it, and mm, I like it. Yeah. It's definitely, it definitely satisfies both of those hemispheres of my brain. Is it an even balance for you, or is this more one of those films where I'm going to come in and you've got it paused on a certain uh, spot? Yeah, the <laughs> what you just said. Full disclosure, I probably haven't watched it in its entirety in a while. That's okay. You still remember the good stuff. <laughs> well, my recommendation is The Bitter Tears of Petra von Kant from 1972. Another of those films that Strickland specifically referenced. I haven't seen that list, but it sounds like it's a great list. This was directed by Rainer Werner Fassbender, and it's based on his own play and stars Margit Karstensen, Erm Hermann, and Hannah Shigula. Maybe the most Fassbender of all Fassbender films, it's about a fashion designer embroiled in a romantic triangle with two other women. If you like the themes in The Duke of Burgundy, an all-female cast, shifting power dynamics in a relationship, a self-contained, even claustrophobic environment sumptuous costumes and appointments, domination and submission, wigs, the promise of a new start, even the occasional mannequin, and you would like to see another entirely vastly different film about and with those things, then Petra von Kant is what you're looking for. It's a more theatrical, more tumultuous presentation. I don't know how many of them you've seen, but Fassbender's films are such a unique experience. It's a physical sensation almost. I don't know quite how to explain Fassbender except that it makes me feel warm and cold all at the same time. This film may be more than any of the others, except for World on a Wire. They both equally make me feel that sensation. So once again, that's two great recommendations, The Lover and the Bitter Tears of Petra von Kant. And that brings us to the end of episode 99. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, we would certainly love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magiclantern. The $5 a month level gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes, and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes, so you never have to go a week without new Magic Lantern in your life. Huge thanks again to Ian Buckley for his support, and for choosing such a great film for our first Patron's Choice episode last time. If you would just like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. A couple of special thanks this time around. We sat down with our friend Aaron West and our partner in our new network, The 25th Frame, to record an episode of Criterion Now, where we talked about Criterion's May release slate. We paid tribute to Albert Finney and Bruno Gans and a lot more. It's always so fun to sit down with Aaron, and you jumped in at the last minute with literally about 10 minutes prep time and knocked it out of the park, so thank you. Well, you're welcome. We also had a fun conversation with our friend Eric Reese, who is currently programming a series for which the theme is The Wise Use of Power, and we talked about Black Panther in relation to those issues, representation in film, and a bunch of other things. That interview will go up on the 25th Frame Patreon as a bonus for those supporters sometime soon. Our thanks to both of those guys for inviting us along. 
And Wakanda forever. I can't stop saying it. Our new network is now up and going strong, and I wanted this time to highlight another of the shows in our family, and that is Good Times Great Movies. And that's hosted by our friends Doug and Jamie. And every other week, they take a look at the best and worst that 80s cinema has to offer. For me, summer school falls under the best. (laughs) I love that episode. We've covered some of the same titles, but in totally different ways, like Desperately Seeking Susan. Yeah, if you're a child of the 80s, or if you just sometimes find yourself sitting around thinking, I wonder if DC Cab holds up, (laughs) then this is really the show for you. We actually did a collaborative thing with them where we contributed our thoughts about one of our favorite 80s neo-noir films, Body Heat. That was super fun. It's a nice trip down memory lane for those of us that grew up when video stores were booming and stayed up too late to watch movies we probably shouldn't have on cable when everybody else had gone to bed. So check out Good Times Great Movies wherever you get your podcasts or at 25thframemedia.com. We are on Twitter, at Lantern underscore cast, and I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Spencer Seams from the High and Low podcast. Drew Tavendale and Scott Morris, those fine gentlemen at Fuds on Film. Laura Cannon over at Fatal Films. Terry and Liz at Happily Cinema Married. Keith Rich, Tim Lego, Travis Trudell, Leanne Kubich, Andy Wolverton, and Mike Scharf. If you're sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure to tag us so we can say thanks. We're on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, and now at the 25th frame. Just about anywhere you get your podcasts, you can find us. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. Fifth Frame, a listener-supported network celebrating film and culture worldwide.